We have an outstanding honor here today. I am talking to Mr. Good Time Charlie and Charlie Cartwright. And I met Charlie forever ago, just in passing. We've never spent any time hanging out. So this is going to be quite an interesting talk. Uh, I know some of his background history and I'm looking forward to hearing more about him. Uh, and I know he's working on quite a big project that he needs the community support with. So everybody sit down, take a listen and see what you can't do to help. Good afternoon, Charlie. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks. Good to see you, sir. It's been a very long time. So I was a little bit aware of your history in the Pike and, and uh, your beginnings and with Jack and, and a bunch of other things. But um, I did read a little bit about you here in preparation of this show. And you started tattooing in 1955, hand poked in the back of a car. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. That is awesome. <laughs> yeah i had a 46 chevy and nice. uh i tattooed in in my car for about five years uh hand poking but i did it every day and pretty continuously so i was uh real fast because i did it all the time and uh Anyway, I had a continuous parade of clients, so I never did run out of uh, skin, I guess one would say. And well, uh, you were and, by a military base, right? Well, the beginning? I, I was by there, but I, I wasn't doing, working on military. I was mostly oh. working on, on just uh, neighborhood people. And uh, well, not just my neighborhood, but from all, I was an honorary member of every gang in town because of the, I was a tattoo man. So they all came to me from everywhere. And, um, but I, uh, I stayed with that in that area, Wichita, Kansas is where I grew up. And, uh, in my formative years and, uh, so from the age of 15 on, I started working out of my 46 Chevy. And, uh, but I got my first car when I was 12 years old. And so that was my third car I had by then when I was 15. But that's when I first got interested in tattooing. And so uh, that's what I, that's what I practiced out of it. In, in the neighborhood there that is awesome now and then um i forget when you, oh you joined the military and that's when you ended up out in uh san diego yes uh, i went and uh, joined the navy and uh th that didn't last very long i was i was in san diego uh for training and uh i graduated from uh, basic training but they got rid of me pretty quick because I, did, I didn't adapt very well to the, what they wanted me to do. And I made it very well known that I wasn't going to play ball with them because they lied to me about some things and when I en enlisted. And so it turned out to be a rather uh, short uh, experience with the Navy. But while I was in there, I actually tattooed uh, several guys behind the lockers on Sundays, uh, even in basic training, I was tattooing these guys behind the lockers uh, by hand. And uh, I put 13 tattoos on one guy in basic training. And <laughs> but that's where I was first exposed to professional tattooing in, uh, in that tattoo town of sailors and i i actually got tattooed by quite a few of them in that area before i left after i got discharged 
And then you, uh, at that point, migrated a little north to the LA area and found the pike? Yes, I did. And then I, I went up there and, and uh, I got tattooed by a lot of those different guys there. Uh, in 1959, I hit the pike. And uh, and I was tattooed by Burt Graham and, and Don Nolan and a lot of different guys that had shops around there too. Lou Lewis and Fred Thornton. And uh, anyway, I, I was I, I became acquainted with quite a few of the tattooers back in the day. There's a couple names there that I'm not even familiar with, and I, I try and uh, you can't know everything about everybody, but I, I try and at least you know acknowledge uh, the guys that were there before me or whatever. So uh, Lou Lewis, uh, that's uh, that's a name I had not heard before for sure. So which one? Lou Lewis. Oh, Lou Lewis, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was very, uh, uh, I guess you'd say, a uh, quiet man. He was, he, his son actually was named Rio de Janeiro. And uh, his son tattooed as well a, in Burke Graham's shop. Really? But Lou, yeah. Uh, but. But but the only tattoo that Rio had was his name and his lip. <laughs> <laughs> and his father was a tattooer. And he says that and I always regretted it that my father never tattooed me. And uh Yeah, I could I could uh, see where that could hurt. Yeah. But, uh, that is awesome. And now okay, so your first shop was working in a in one of the west coast was that yeah it? Your... yeah okay. the first stop i ever worked in uh was downtown skid row fifth and main in los angeles at uh, west coast tattoo and uh they kept me there probably about oh three months to six months I, i'm not sure a few months and then they transferred me to the bike to the shop down there that Captain Jim Melanson and uh, Jimbo Laporte were partners in. And so uh, I worked down there for almost three years, I guess, two, two years plus before I went to East LA. But I knew I was going to East LA from the gate once I figured out what was happening with electric machines. I thought, well, I'm just going to go to East LA eventually, and because uh, that's that's tattoo heaven. Yeah, now, I have some fond memories of West Coast uh, myself because uh, I went out there uh, in its current form, where the uh, Baba owns it now. Uh, one of the West Coasts, I think, or the only West Coast left in uh, LA. And I went out there, and Rick Walters and Tennessee Dave gave me a all day ink mixing lesson, and. Uh, that was, man, it had to be the early 2000s. So that was a good time. A couple of good guys. But uh, yeah, West Coast, it's got a, a an important place in my heart, too. So that's yeah. cool. And Captain, or I mean, uh, Tennessee Dave, he was quite the character to work with. <laughs> I, I worked with him downtown there uh, for a while. With him and Little Dave Spellman. Uh, and, and little Dave, he, he was a riot because he had um, he had this silver unit. It was a chrome looking cabinet and uh, it had bells and whistles and switches and gauges and stuff all over it. And, and when people would ask, so how do you get into this business? And he says, first, you have to have one of these. And they say, <laughs> Well, where do you get one of those? And he said, you got to make it. <laughs> that, that ended the conversation right there on how you get the business. <laughs> yeah. It was just a big mystery thing that he built. <laughs> it was just fake. <laughs> All right. Now you got to tell me, did you guys actually put bags over people's heads back in the day? I know some, they, there's stories that some of the the older guys out there, when people started asking questions about tattooing, they just throw a bag over their head. You ever done anything <laughs> like that or seen it? Because I, I had never heard that one. That's a good one, though. 
I've heard it, but I haven't been able to confirm it yet. So I just, I wish somebody could confirm that at some point. That's but, great though. Good idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then you moved on into the, the, the East LA thing, which was, you know, a uh, highly uh, Latin community and uh, you know, you and Jack and, and some others really kind of started founded, foundered that uh, uh, single needle, the penitentiary style, as they say, or whatever. Right. So yeah. that's where that really started or. Well, yeah. Uh, when I, when I first went to East LA, <coughs> Most of the uh, professional tattooers, the thinnest line they made at that time was a tight three. And uh, a tight three needle configuration. But when we went to East LA, uh, of course, all these guys, all the homies there, they, they said, well, uh, they like the penitentiary look, you know. Of course, that's what they were familiar with those thin lines and, and uh, nothing but black. And uh, so I thought, well, that's no problem because I had tattooed a single needle by hand so many times and people would say, well, that's not going to last. And I says, well, I'm looking at this. This thing's been in my hand now for all these years. I'm still looking at it and it, and it was put there by hand. So what are you talking about? That's not going to last the single needle, but uh, that was no problem to me uh, because uh, mechanically all you had to do was just uh, with the three needle configuration, all you had to do was pull one needle out farther and uh, to allow it to penetrate the skin. And so I, I think we solved that problem immediately when those guys says, well, can, can you make thinner lines? And I said, well, yeah, I've because I had done that in the past by hand, and that was no problem. Mechanically, you just didn't want a little skinny number 12 needle flopping around on a needle bar. So you, uh, so that the other two gave it stability and uh, where it was, you know, stiff. But as uh, later on, when I, after I moved back to Kansas and sold the shop there in East LA to Ed Hardy, I switched to a number 10 needle single because you could put that straight on a needle bar with no support. And it still was a nice fine line. So, but yeah, we went to the single needle simply because of it was the, the cultural, you know, request. Mm -hmm. They were looking for that single uh, guitar string or staple yeah, line. Re real thin line, yeah. And so that was no uh, no problem. It took off right away, uh, being very popular. Uh, and little did I realize that it would become what it became. <laughs> but, you know, we were just uh, satisfying the general public. And I guess that's what we're still doing, it looks like. <laughs> well... Some tattooers are some, some guys are stuck in their own head and want to do their stuff and they don't care about what the customer wants, which doesn't make sense to me. I yes. think we're, we've always been customer service. Uh, right. We're here to give the customer what they want and then take the damn money. So, you know, yeah. it's, it's a job. Uh, it's just so. like the film in the film when I said, you got to give them the haircut they want, you know, <laughs> That's what it boils down to. That they come to you for, uh, you know, wanting a certain product or a, a certain design and a certain style and so forth. And if you can supply it, well, you're making them happy, and they'll keep making you happy. Okay. So uh, now, how long were you working on the Pike? I, I forget that before you moved back to Kansas. Started there in '73. And I left in 75. Okay. So not too long, but. Yeah, a couple you know, of years. You started a whole movement. So, I mean, that's yeah. a big deal. Well, when I went to, when I went to East LA, I mean, when I went downtown to try out, I say, as they, you might say, to audition for these guys, because I had, I had went into, uh, to go back to the beginning there. I went to the Pike one night and I thought, you know, 
these guys just don't get, they won't give you the right scoop on anything. Everybody wanted to just kind of give you the cold shoulder. And even though I had been tattooed repeatedly by some of these guys, they still wouldn't let me in on, on uh, my basic questions that I had for them about, because I wanted to understand really about as an occupation, as a professional tattooer, uh, I would just be going down there to get, get a tattoo or, or talk to these guys. And so I wasn't going to spend the whole weekend there probing them. But uh, while I was there, I wanted to learn as much as I could. But you couldn't just uh, keep badgering these guys because they just wouldn't have it. And, and so uh, in spite of the fact that I was around them quite often, they still wouldn't answer questions for me like this it do, do you guys just do this part-time or is this just a hobby or is this a full-time career and and how many days do you work and all that stuff because i was trying to figure it out as a profession uh from these guys what they were doing so and, you weren't even asking technical questions you just you just wanted to know yeah how they got by yeah, and, and how often they tattooed and all that stuff, you know? And I didn't want to just spend the uh, day after day there trying to figure out the, the moves. But I finally got so disgusted with it, I, I went down there and I told my wife, I said, you know, I'm just going to get more answers than I'm getting. And I'm not coming back till I'm smarter than <laughs> I am. So I went down there and I, and I, I walked in the West Coast and uh, Mike Crow was tattooing. And he's an old hippie that's gone now. Uh, but he he happened to be a charcoal artist uh, that did portraits, I guess, as uh, before he started tattooing. But he was a personal friend of of uh, Jimbo Laporte. So he, he went to work there. Well, he was the only guy in the shop when I walked in. Start, so I start probing him with, uh, you know, how often do you tattoo and blah, blah, blah. And, and he said, who wants to know? Why do you want to know all this? And I said, well, I'm just asking questions. And he said, yeah, well, you know, I got no, I got no more answers for you. And so I said, well, you know, that just pisses me off because I'm a tattooer. And I said, so you guys just won't give me any straight answers about anything. I said, I know how to tattoo, man, and I'm going to figure this out. And so Jimbo Laporte came busting through the back back curtains they opened and he came through and he said so you know how to tattoo huh and i said yes i do and he says well why don't you take some skin down to fifth and main and we'll see what you got so and he told me when to go he said i'll tell him you're coming and i said all right so i took my neighbor one of my neighbors who lived a few blocks away I, who I had tattooed several times and him, him and his brother Bo. And I said, I'm going to, I want you to go downtown with me and, and they want to see what I got. And he said, okay. So we go down there. And when we walked in, Zeke Owen was the only guy in the shop at the time. And so Zeke said, you must be Charlie. And I said, I am. And he said, well, here's the set. They said you were coming, man. He said, here's the setup. I'm going to go get some coffee and a burger and I'll be back. So he just walked out and I, and I said, well, okay, here we go. <laughs> and uh, so I, I said, what do you want? What do you want? He said, I, maybe some mushrooms on my leg. And I said, okay. So I uh, put some mushrooms on his leg and, and I said, I've never worked in color. Do you want any of this color? And he said, okay. And, so I put some in him and I cleaned it all up. And I think I even put the words, uh, uh, Ongo Sagrados, uh, sacred mushrooms. And, uh, anyway, I cleaned him all up and was just winding up when Zeke walked back in and he says, wow. He says, guys been tattooing 10 years. So tattoo like that. Even. And, and I said, well, I've been a tattoo man, but, uh, anyway, he says, I, I'll tell you what, he said, it's obvious 
that you know what's going on. He says, but if you've never worked with anyone before, uh, it's, I would advise you just to work with other tattooers for at least a year or two to just figure out a few tips of the trade. And he says, uh, that, that will help you because everybody knows a little something that nobody else knows or practices. And he says, and it'll all be good for you. All this info is going to be good. So he says, uh, that's what I would advise you. Just work with somebody at least a year or two before you go to East LA. Because <laughs> I told him, I'm going to East LA when I figure this out. <laughs> and uh, and so anyway, he told me to do that. And so I said, okay. And so that's what I did. I, I worked with other guys for a couple of years there at the pike and um and then they uh uh then i decided it's time to get out of here and go do my thing well anyway i had uh, over the course of time while i was there i had met jack rudy and uh and as a customer and and he well he was bringing friends as a customer that he would draw designs on them and then i would tattoo them and uh and i thought well this guy can draw and he really can letter uh and so <clears throat> i thought i i would uh give him a shot when i went to east l.a because uh i i don't know if i ever told this before but i think i did but uh, once when he left with one of his friends who i tattooed uh, he'd been scribbling on a piece of cardboard for probably an hour or hour and a half while I was working on this guy. And after he left, I picked up that cardboard. And that's when I made the decision that Jack needed to be involved if he, uh, if possible, because the guy was, I was looking at maybe 10 different styles of Cholo lettering. And I thought, well, he's the white boy, but he's, he's familiar with the Latin you know, uh, community. And I had worked on uh, where I grew up. It was mostly half, almost half brown and half white neighborhood. And uh, so, and, and because I was exposed to Mexicans all my life by living in Texas and Kansas too, I always ran around with Mexican people. So I, I even think in Spanish as much as English probably. Uh, because I, I've just been around them so much, and I I speak more Spanish than my wife, and she's Chicana, born in East <laughs> L.A., you know, and and she and her and her friends used to ask me all the time, Chicanas, how do you say this and how do you say that? Because they don't even know, but they were born in, you know, <laughs> they're Chicanas. But anyway, so going to East L.A. was no problem for me because I could speak to the to the guys from the other side, as well as the, the locals that had their own, you know, their own lingo and slang. But uh, anyway. Let me ask you real quick. Okay. Now, when Zeke lent you his equipment there that day, that was your first time picking up an electric machine. Yeah, for me. Well, I, I did have an, I did have kind of a homemade rig before I didn't like it that I had bought from a guy and it, I didn't like it at all. So I went back to doing hand work again, but yeah, that was the first time. And Zeke even told me that was the first time he'd ever let anybody even work with his machines. And, and, you know, he said, by the way, I've never, as I was walking out, I've never let anybody work with my machines before. And I thought, wow, well, thanks, man. You know? <laughs> now, how long did it take you? Like, 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 did you get the groove in a few minutes or was it, did you struggle for the first 20 minutes? How did oh, that go? no, not at all. It was just, I just went right to it. Like I'd been doing it all my life. That is awesome. Yeah. I, it just, yeah, it just was an automatic. Yeah. Awesome. Just, just, just doing art right out of the gate. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, okay. So I guess East LA, I guess that's the one I was asking. How long did you spend in East LA with that crew? I was there from 75 to late 77. Uh, and then I sold the shop to Hardy and because I wanted to cross culture my kids and move back to Kansas. 
uh, where it was a little more, I guess you'd say, Christian oriented uh, for for my uh, you know kids to, to. I didn't want them to grow up in in L.A. and think that was the whole world, you know. Right. Because it's a pretty cold hearted community out there. It can be. In 2007, I, I ended up selling my shop and moving back to Massachusetts uh, to bring my kids when they were six and eight years old back to live near our family. So I, I, I understand the thought process there. That's, all, that, that's fantastic. Yeah, my kids were uh, 15, 13, and 11. And I thought, boy, I got I to gotta expose them to the to the other side before they get away from me and get out from under my roof. Mm -hmm. And so um, I just wanted them to get introduced to Midwestern values and concerns about their fellow man, you know, mm -hmm. because in, in California, you know how it is. You can be stabbed and laying on the floor and somebody will step over you and take a picture of you with the camera as it's going past you. <laughs> yeah, yep. Yeah, just a tourist, you know, just uh well actually the tourists might try and stop and help, but the people that live there, they're gonna walk right by. That's for sure. Yeah, uh, yeah no, I uh, I spent some time out there. I, I was I was technically homeless in uh in LA. I lived on Venice Beach for a while. I tell people all the time I lived on Venice Beach, and they're like, That must have been great. And I said, No, I lived on the beach. <laughs> no walls, no roof on the beach so that was a short time in uh summer of 86 so yeah good times oh, oh but, uh, yeah yeah so then you went back to kansas and then yeah. uh how long were you back there before you uh took off to uh west again well i was back there almost nine years uh right at 10 years i guess and uh and I opened up into the trail back there. Uh, and my son, well, both my sons started with me as teenagers when they were out of school in the summer. They were uh, either soldering needles or, you know, uh, engraving acetates or, or repairing machines or they were mixing colors or they learned it all as uh, as teenagers uh, when they were out of school in the summer so i was back there that almost 10 years before i came back to california uh ed hardy had, had called me after he'd been in uh been there eight years in east l.a uh, he asked me if i wanted to buy the shop back buy the shop back again and i said no if i come to california i'm probably going to go to northern california next and so that's what i did uh i just uh, our best friends from la had moved up here to modesto and uh th so they wanted us to move over here and it was my wife's very best friend and i told her oh, okay i don't care uh, i'll i'll figure it out wherever i go and so uh, I came to Modesto, and at that time, there was nobody tattooing for a 100-mile circle around me in Modesto. You had to go to Sacramento, Fresno, or San Francisco, 90 miles any direction. So I didn't step on anybody's toes here. In fact, I pioneered the whole damn valley. Nice. And, uh, yeah, and I pioneered, when I went to Kansas, there was, there was no tattoo, a professional tattoo operation in the state anywhere except Kansas City. And I was in Wichita, which was hundreds of miles from there. So basically, I pioneered that whole state when I went back there. And uh, because nobody was doing it, you know. And so, and when I, and of course, when I went to East LA, nobody wanted to go there. And so I pioneered that area too. So nobody can ever accuse me of stepping on their toes and opening up on them. Yeah, I know. <laughs> See, areas of this country, I've totally pioneered. 
Uh, now you can't throw a rock without hitting five tattooers. It's, it's, I know. It. It's just in amazing. Fact, in fact, they tell me that there's 80. I don't know this. I don't know where they are, but they tell me that there are 80 tattoo operations in my area that are licensed. Wow. And, and I'm in a little co community of a quarter of a million people, you know? Yeah, when, when I opened my first shop down in the, the Phoenix area, I think there was only maybe eight shops in the whole Phoenix area. And when I sold my shop in 2007, there had to have been 150. It was, <laughs> it, it was like 7-Elevens on every corner. Just, just, and I think it's even worse now. But, well, I, I've often heard that Arizona and Texas are complete shit storms for... Uh, for the uh, regulation and, and so forth that there's no there's no nobody that pays attention even it's just it's kind of a free range operation yeah when i first landed in arizona i went out to meet dick goldman and um we got along great and uh we kind of tried to work on regulation for a little bit and the background but he wanted more regulation and I was always telling them, be careful because careful what you wish for, because the government has a tendency to uh, overregulate. You know, you yeah. want a little regulation and they want to go crazy. So, but I think it is still relatively unregulated out there. It just, uh, I worked with other well known shops in the area and we self regulated uh, as far as sterility went and, and uh, having our, our waste uh, hauled off by uh, biohazard companies and incinerated. And, and we did a lot of good there, but there was always shops that just didn't care. There always yeah. will be. Oh yeah. That's the nature of the business. It's a, it's a complete outlaw business, really. You know, it, it's the ultimate outlaw game. I think. Well, <laughs> I think that's changing. Uh, I, I, I liked it better when it was more outlaw, you know. Oh, but, I did uh, too. Yeah, I did too. But uh, now, you know, now anybody, you can't do anything nowadays without upsetting somebody. So, well, now it's, it's such a common life. craft. It's such a common craft now that uh, the, the the very you know grandmas that used to discourage their their granddaughters from getting a tattoo now they encourage them to be another cat on D, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, or they it, want to get a tattoo with that granddaughter. It's, yeah, exactly. So it's it's become such a common craft anymore that that I finally realized what am I even doing here? After I, I, I've got eighty operations around me, so I closed my shop. You know, I finally closed it. I thought this is just stupid. You know, everybody's a tattooer now. What the hell am I doing here? You know. Well, I moved on to supplying those tattooers. So <laughs> just because I saw the, I saw the way the world was going too. So uh, yeah, I, I liked being tattooed when nobody was tattooed. Yeah. Now that everybody's tattooed, I'm, uh, it, it's lost some of its mystique for sure. I but, hear you, Mark. <laughs> but I still, I, I still love it. I'm still passionate about it, but uh, it's, it, it's, it has lost the mystique for sure. Um, well, yeah. Now you, Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm, I'm just saying that I, I totally agree with you that it's just a, it's such a mystery. What, when, what, what are we doing? Just everybody's just trading money now with each other. You know, it's basically what it is. It's just, it's pretty ridiculous when, of course, I, I I've never lost my love of tattoos. I'm full of them my, down to my toes. I'm, I'm all filled up. I'm my whole body's done the way I want it to be done. And I love everything about tattoos. I love applying them. I love wearing them. I love designing them and, and creating them. And I notice uh, you didn't say you liked getting them because nobody likes getting them. <laughs> oh, well, you know, I never minded getting them even actually I felt them all of course because i do have feeling but i didn't care what it felt like mm. because i just knew i wanted them and i i used to think oh so that's what it feels like there because i experimented on myself all over my body and i tattooed myself 44 times 
And uh, and I, so I, I would always think, oh, so that's what that feels like in that area. But it's different, but mm -hmm. it was all, it was all desirable in my opinion. So I've only had two tattoos I can say that actually I would call damn painful. And that was behind my knees uh, on the backside of your legs. Oh my God, I don't know how you can ever get ready for that. And then uh, my lower back, I had Pinky Yoon tattoo me. And, uh, and he was known to be a very brutal tattooer, but I didn't care if he crucified me. I wanted him to tattoo me. And uh, oh my God, I used to tell people uh, that it's better if you lean into it instead of shrink away from it. But I found myself starting to shrink away from him because he would, he would, he would sink it to the tube and run it. You know, he didn't work off the tip of the needle like I did. He just, he just buried that thing and ran it right across through bone or whatever. It, it didn't matter. <laughs> and so, so that really, really woke me up. Wow. One of my worst was uh, I had a Bowery Stan Moskowitz tattoo my ditch. Um, <laughs> and he made me lightheaded. It was, it was a real good one. In fact, Catfish yeah. Carl had to go get me something to drink that day because I almost passed out. Uh, but yeah, it, uh, Stan was 76 years old when he tattooed me. And I don't know if anybody can see there. I got a uh, the 13 here in my ditch. And that's my advice to anybody. Never let a 76-year-old man tattoo your ditch. Oh, <laughs> that one. Yeah. And it's a little one too, but wow. Yeah. Not, not a good day. <clears throat> but, all right. Now, uh, as far as history goes, I'm, I'm loving this project you're working on. Uh, it's you and Jack and Carrie and, and a few others. I'm forgetting all the names right away. But uh, you're trying to put together a real museum. I mean, there's a bunch of small museums put on by good tattooers around the country, uh, noble cause by noble people. But you're trying to put together a large scale production. Or, and uh, could you give us a little information? Yeah, well, I, that's a problem. I, I thought because over through, uh, through all the years that I've been a tattooer, uh, a lot of different ones that I've known have told me, what do we do with all this shit we've collected through all these years? You know, there's no place to put it, you know? So most, that's why most guys have their own personal little museum, like you were saying, and they're spotted all over the country. Uh, but we don't really, America doesn't really have what I would call a national tattoo museum where people know that's where you go to look at tattoo history and and so uh, i i thought to myself after we did the uh la history museum historical museum exhibit probably five years ago or more uh, we thought to our you know, me and, and my assistant were talking, Kimiko, uh, about with some of the staff from the museum up there about, we, LA needs a tattoo museum, you know? And so uh, we, they, all those, the whole staff came up here and I tattooed all three of them that worked on that project. They, they came up to Modesto and I tattooed them and we went out and had a little talk afterwards. We went out and ate and, and we were talking about, we gotta have a national tattoo museum somewhere. And not like maybe the Smithsonian, although that'd be nice, but it's something of that scale would be pretty grand. Yeah. But uh, anyway, we were talking about LA needing one and I said, well, Long Beach is the port of Los Angeles and, and it's got such a history of tattooing uh, to me it's really the headquarters of West Coast tattooing and so uh, I think it should be in Long Beach and so discussing that we finally decided yeah that that would be great and so that's what I'm working on now and um, and 
because Carrie Barba has Burt Graham's whole shop, which is really the historical spot of all times on the West Coast, I would say, uh, for tattooing. Uh, and I'm glad she has that because she's really done a wonderful job of uh, preserving it and, and keeping it alive. But she's totally game with us. To, we didn't want to rain on her parade or overshadow her or anything. That wasn't my desire. I just felt like there, there should be more than just a, a shop. You know, we should have a, a righteous big building that people from all over the nation can, and not just the nation, but the world could come here and we want people from Japan to be able to come to the United States and look at tattoos too, you know. Uh, and the, although we have a, a, an Asian representative here, you know, with the uh, in Los Angeles and uh, and in Long Beach, they actually have a little Polynesian tattoo museum. Um, but we need something that's that's grandiose in size that really represents a lot of American tattooers. And so that's what we're working on. And uh, we've talked to several people uh, involved in, with the city for redevelopment projects and so forth. And they're all game. The city of Long Beach is crying for uh, expansion and development anyway. And so they're, they're more than happy to work with us on projects. And so that, that's what we're doing. They're, uh, they're, I guess you'd say, willing to uh, work with us on so many different areas. And, and for there's, there's a three block area in Atla on Atlantic Boulevard there that they've been focusing on trying to redevelop. It's been re really, pretty let go over the years, but uh, the one builder that they're working, that we're working with is he's been buying up properties for years around there that are commercial. And I guess um, that's part of the whole redevelopment thing. They're trying to use those properties in conjunction with the city to help things kind of get turned around. So anyway, uh, we're, we're looking at uh, several locations and, and uh, we've got, I believe, enough support in the tattoo world to make it happen uh, because, of, well, within just in the local community there, we've got everything that we could possibly ever need in the way of the, the trades. Uh, being carpenters, painters, and all that. So if we do need construction on the inside of any of these buildings, you know, to make it be what we want it to be, I'm sure we've got all the help we we can uh, want or need. Mm -hmm. I so, wonder if there's any um, any grants for, I mean, because there's uh, some serious historical value for the local culture there. So I'm wondering if there might be any sort of a city or state federal yeah. grants to uh, support uh, such a, an endeavor. I believe there are. And uh, Jimmy goes looking into those. And, uh, and I'm sure it's all going to be um, through either through uh, grants or through donations and people keep calling and wanting to donate already uh, stuff but we don't have, we need an archive to protect and preserve this stuff, uh, you know, until it can be displayed properly. We can't just start taking stuff and jamming it somewhere, you know, in, uh, in a garage or closet or anything. Why and, not? Lyle Tuttle's been doing it for decades. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he has. <laughs> <laughs> But that guy's I, been. That guy was planning his museum from the day I met him all the way up to the end. So, uh, I hopefully Danielle pulls through and gets some of that done. I don't know if you guys are working together behind the we'd scenes. We'd like to. Like we'd like to help her out somehow. Uh, I guess she's struggling now, from what I hear. But uh, 
God bless her. She's got a, uh, a well, a wonderful package there to take care of. Uh, yeah. It's amazing. It's really amazing what he has. I, I saw, I, I, of course, I haven't handled everything he's got, but I've seen a lot of stuff he's got and uh, been to his place and went through a lot of stuff. But uh, I, I think we're going to be fine as far as contributions from with stuff. But what we need is contributions with money to uh, that's the, the main thing right now that we got to focus on is the grants and the contributions uh, monetarily. And uh, so uh, we, we do have a few, I guess, levels uh, that have been developed for contributors. Uh, I guess the top one we can talk about is uh, $2,500 is a lifetime. Uh, you're a lifetime member and uh, with that you'll get a t-shirt a mug and a poster or something the contributions are are what we need to start focusing on we've already had the first uh twenty five hundred dollar contribution come uh and uh and also the the first thousand dollar contribution to for a four thousand dollars, your your name gets on the wall on a on a brass plaque, and uh, so it'll be on down to you know, I guess the coffee cup level. But I don't know. I think it's seventy five dollars or something, uh, maybe fifty dollars. I don't. I'm not even sure. But we, anyway, we got several levels where you can participate. And of course, anything's appreciated. And uh, and anyway, it's just going to take a little time, I think, to develop all the all the funds it takes to make it happen. But if it's if it's a uh, if tattoo tattooing has been good as good to everybody as it's been to me, they can all kick down some money. I think I uh, agree. And uh, in fact. Uh, People tell me all the time, well, they everybody ought to be paying you to even be in business. To, what, look where you started, you know, the, the black and gray tattooing. And, uh, well, you know, if they want to think of it as a tribute to me, well, give me some damn money. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm definitely going to help you out somehow for sure. Uh, but let, our, 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 our bigger job is to get the word out so that we can get the story known and other people can help and, uh, and everybody can hopefully start sending a little something to you. Now, these, these, uh, these uh, donation packages, are these going to be annual packages or are these one-time packages? Or, I mean, because the museum's going to need money even after it's open, continue. Oh, yeah, sure. It's going to be, it, it'll, it'll be it'll be uh ongoing i'm sure uh but you know what i think we're i think she's considering um a 25 or 30 dollar ticket fee to the uh she's done some research and and i think she's decided that that's about the average cost uh for a museum mm -hmm. so uh, so there'll be a certain amount of money raised like that, but we want to have a gift shop also, and then we actually want to have a cafe uh, for socialization and also a fundraising. I remember Lyle had the Tattoo Rose Cafe, and uh, and why not? You know, I mean, it's just another. Uh, another way to contribute money to the to the support you know absolutely i mean uh, whatever it takes really it just needs to get up and running um so i mean i i um we're going to do our part we will we will plug it through our end i will uh, be happy to uh you know make a donation on behalf of needle jig and we'll get the word out there tell as many people as we possibly can to uh 
to get this going. Have you have you gotten uh, an account set up where money can be donated already? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We do. We got a bank account, and uh, we're legal in every way so far uh, that we know of. I mean, we've got we're able to operate. Uh, start taking money we've got all our federal numbers and our we're cleared with the state and the federal on every level uh to be uh you know a nonprofit organization okay very and, good huh i said that's very good you already gotta get a jump on it yeah um, we, we've been working on it uh okay. if you home gamers want to make a donation directly go to tattoo heritage project.org and you can donate directly through that site. I want to know a little bit more about your history. I mean, the, 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 the museum is awesome. That's fantastic. But uh, uh, I want to know more about Charlie Cartwright. I mean, uh, you've, you've done a lot. And, you know, you span well, a couple of decades or more in the tattoo world. <laughs> and, and you seem to be a, like a, a damn fine fella. I'm enjoying our talk for sure. But um, tell me something nobody else knows about Charlie Cartwright. What uh, in the tattoo world? What's uh, what? There's got to be something out there. You have 60, 65, 70 years tattooing yeah. now? 66 years now. Wow. Like, and, 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 you know, like I, like I said, I, when I, I started off as a, you know, just a kid that like i was so fascinated with tattoos um that uh well when i started in the back of my you know and, and working in my car there i would lay them down on the back seat to do chest or stomach work you know and uh and the the uh community there all came to one shopping center and uh, and so I, I never ran out of work. I was always parked at the end of the parking lot. And uh, I was just a dumb kid that just loved tattoos and and wanted to wanted to do them. And I kept doing them. And I never dreamed that it would become what it became. But um, I was a preacher's kid first of all, and, uh, and my dad obviously had great differences between <laughs> what I thought about and what he thought was cool. <laughs> uh, but, but he, he objected to tattooing on a, what I would call a, a, a legalistic approach to it spiritually, because according to the, uh, Leviticus 1828, you know, cut not your flesh nor mark any prints upon you. Well, he 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 took that very literally, you know, and I and I said, well, Dad, that was, you know, I I, I had a hard time trying to make him understand that that we're Gentiles and we live under grace, and he still stuck to the old legalistic aspect of of uh, you know not not getting tattooed not getting tattooed and and uh because it was in the the uh i guess you'd say uh I, it was a not for the jewish people to be doing according to the bible and uh that the god didn't want all the uh the jews get marking themselves up like the their pagan neighbors did but but their pagan neighbors did it to uh, generally to get their loved ones out of purgatory or wherever they thought they were. It was always appeasing a false god or something, and, and I wasn't doing it for that reason at all, you know. And to me, I I just think if you're a Jew, you live by those old laws, but as Gentiles we don't. So. There was great disagreement about that with me and my dad. And um, so, but I, I, I stuck with it anyway, regardless. And, and he, you know, and, and we, 
over the years, as time went on, we he finally accepted it, and uh, he never did. He never did. Uh, I think fully embrace it, but he accepted it as my future because he told me at one time he says, "I just don't understand how how you travel around like you do and you spend so much money and." And I said, what are you talking about, Dad? And he said, well, you know, and you just, the way you live. And I said, well, what's wrong with the way I live? And he was so concerned about me spending money. And well, he grew up very poor. And that was the difference. He didn't, he couldn't realize that how I could make such a good living, you know. And anyway, uh, as time went on, he, he, he told me, he says, uh, you know, I never make it my business to figure out how much money you make, but he was real concerned about that. So I told him and he said, wow, this was years ago and, and probably in 82 or something. And he says, uh, wow, that's more money than the president makes. And I said, well, I don't know what the president makes, but i know what i'm making and and so he was he was so impressed with money that was his whole thing you know because mm -hmm. he was a poor guy and so it it was he was very impressed with making money and and to me i just thought well money just follows whatever success you have you know mm -hmm. it, i it, i grew up poor and um to me, money is just a tool. It's just, it's, it's, it's there. Obviously I've had it. I've not had it and obviously prefer to have some, but sure. ultimately it's not that important really. It's um, not. It's I, I can't not. be driven by money. I, and people that are driven by money usually fall short on almost everything they try. So I, I don't know. It's just, to try and get into a race with other humans is, is it's, it doesn't make sense to me. I'm going to keep doing me. You've obviously done you, you followed your path, your spirit, and uh, that's paid off for you. It, it, it works well for you. Well, you know, the, the bottom line is that how many hamburgers does a guy need, you know? <laughs> and, and I used, and I preach that all the time to these cats that want, they want their own convention, their own color line, their own machine line. They don't, they're not satisfied with one shop, but they want five. You know, I mean, I, it basically, how many hamburgers do you need? You know? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, and some people want more products, more shops, more everything to gain the money, the sales. Uh, but then there's people out there like myself or whatever that, I want more products because I keep, I want to keep putting better products out there. The fact that I make money off them is kind of second in nature. You know, it's just, it, but I, I wouldn't put a product out just to make money. I want to put a product out that's, that's worth owning. And it just happens to make me money. If that makes some sense to you. I mean, there's yeah. companies out there 10 times the size of my company and they can have that. I don't, I, I, I'm not impressed or, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not impressed. I I'm going to keep doing what I do. Yeah. And that's, that's, right. that's the only thing I know how to do is just yeah. be me. So. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't lust after anybody's, uh, um, uh, I guess you'd say, uh, success. Mm -hmm. I don't begrudge anybody making it making whatever they want to make you know but i just know that i'm just satisfied i guess satisfied with uh less or or i don't know i i, I just know that i'm a pretty simple man and and as long as my uh i'm out of the rain and i got something to eat well i'm okay you know <laughs> Not a bad way to be, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not like I, I tell a lot of people. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm not trying to 
well, way back when, I wasn't trying to set the woods on fire. I was just trying to start a little blaze in the homies' hearts, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> uh, right. I just wanted to satisfy my customers. So that's important. I mean, and, and obviously that's what led to your ultimate success too, is, is just taking care of people. Um, yeah. It's important. I do have another question though. Uh, I, I remember reading in your, your biography, you were tattooed by Tahiti Felix. Oh yeah. Uh, Tahiti Felix. Yeah. Yeah. What yeah, did he, he tattoo on you? He tattooed an anchor on me. It was my first professional tattoo when I first got Liberty uh, from the boot camp, and uh, he put an anchor on my upper arm, and uh, so that was that was the beginning of the begin, as they say. I guess you know it, it went on from there because I got tattooed by uh, Painless Nell and her her cousin or her, her sister, I guess they call it, she called her. Uh, but uh, they, they had a bucket shop there, you know, and uh, the Listerine water and the sponge and, you know, cause he got, and he got shaved with the straight razor. I mean, I did all that too, eventually, but uh, that was my first intro introduction, you know, and one did the, uh, one did the outline and the other did the shading, you know. Well, that's the oldest shop in San Diego. And a good friend of mine, Tahiti, uh, Tahiti Gil, or Gil Tanani, he owns that shop now. He's a good friend of mine. And he's, uh, uh, he, they just recently found an archive of, uh, from Tahiti Felix's estate that they just uh, dug out, I want to say this summer. So there's a, a bunch of new art in, uh, and, and stuff out there that uh, has just recently found daylight again. So... I'm going to tell them to get in touch with you too, because I am sure that that would be cool to have some of that in your in the museum when you get it going. Cause, uh, Oh yeah. It's sure. just, that just adds another part to the story. That's a pretty big building block in your history and you're the building block in the museum's history. So I think yeah. that connection needs to be made. Yeah. That's a good thing. Yeah. Well, uh, you getting tired of me yet? <laughs> oh no <laughs> all right i think we've been talking about an hour here i don't want to keep you too long um but i gotta tell you man i i love the stories and i i do hope to see you again someday in person um do you still tattoo at all anymore just friends or anything or well uh, just at, con at conventions once in a while i'll i'll just do the a little banger on them you know all right uh, well i yeah. would i would love to catch up with you at a show and catch something uh get a little something from you at some point if that would be possible and uh and i don't like getting tattooed so that would be special <laughs> yeah well generally i just just to put my initials on them and uh you know that i mark them you know. I'll take it. I have the worst tattoo Lyle Tuttle ever did in his life because I told, I told him I knew Lyle from, uh, I met him in 96 and wanted to get tattooed the whole time. And I always told him, I love you. You're my friend, but I don't want your name on me. And uh, <laughs> honestly, after he tattooed me, I wish I let him put his name on me. <laughs> because <laughs> at least at least it would have been legible but uh but yeah, yeah I, I would love to meet up with you at some point and i would be honored to, to even just get your initials at this point that's all i want to do anymore is collect little Stuff. tiny tattoos from people from yeah. the, the people i enjoy and that that's it i don't want anything big i don't think so and where do you live at i'm in massachusetts yeah yeah so i'm a, I'm a little bit away from you but uh i definitely have a tendency to get out there and around and when the world frees up for traveling a little bit more i'm sure we'll get together at some point well you know what i i remember it back in the day massachusetts was it was still illegal there as uh because i remember a couple named the kennedys went there years ago 
and tried to open up and they and they were determined to open up but but we kept saying the real the big Kennedys are never going to let you open in Massachusetts and and so they never did the, this couple went broke they stayed there a couple of years trying to get get it going fighting the state and that never did happen I guess oh uh, it, it finally did happen but that wasn't really that long ago maybe 20 years ago yeah, uh, right. when I started tattooing here it was illegal so I worked illegally for a short time and then I went to Arizona where I could practice my craft uh legitimately yeah. so yeah, right. yeah I'm very familiar with that 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 story in fact one of the guys that worked hard towards uh legalization here in Massachusetts he's based in this city uh he, he owns lefties tattoos here uh nice guy Steven's a good guy but that took, that was a long, hard fight. It definitely was. Yeah. Well, you know, it's now ever, I, I remember the, the last state that, that was allowed or that can't, became legal was Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was there in Oklahoma the day it became legal. And uh, me and my wife had actually went back there to uh, visit one of my friends who was dying in the hospital in Oklahoma city. And so we get there that evening. Uh, it's late, late in the evening and we're looking for a, a restaurant and to eat at, and we're driving around town. We're unfamiliar with the area and we're looking for a, a place and, and everywhere we go, all these commercial buildings have people outside with ladders and back and uh, banners and, signs and stuff and it, it's all about tattoos and i thought what and so on the news that night i heard on the radio or the tv that tomorrow will be the first day tattoos are legal in oklahoma and i thought wow we got we got here just to watch it happen <laughs> yeah and, i mean that and when the floodgates open in a place like that it's it's ridiculous for a while. It just uh, everybody and their brother opens a shop, and some survive and some don't. It, That's right. This it, it gets messy. But. And now it seems like to me, no matter what your product consists of, you will have takers. It just seems like there's no such thing as real rotten tattooers anymore, <laughs> because it seems like. Well, either that or nobody cares what they're getting. Because well, it it's a little bit of both, I think. Um, I get mad when I see shops that are like, you know, just shouldn't be working. But I finally had to relax and realize there there have to be shops for every walk of life. You know, exactly. you need your you need your super high end shops for the guys that want to spend a lot of money, and then you need you you know the people don't have much. They need access too. So. Yeah, there, there's going to be there's always going to be business to support every level, I think. So and I, I think and so it may too. not be a bad thing. I don't know. And, and you know, uh, I, I don't know if you know, but recently I, I spoke with 70 to 70 tattooers in Spokane, Washington that had. Uh, well, I, I went up there because this guy was having his 10th anniversary for his shop and and he wanted me to come and uh, he had an extra room in this building that he rents. And so he, he told me, he says, uh, Charlie, I want you to come and speak to these, uh, all these tattooers. He says, I've invited 70 tattooers who, who don't know each other, who hate each other, who just hear rumors about each other. Everybody in town, I've invited them all. <laughs> and he says, when I came here 10 years ago, None of them would hire me because I was from Southern California and I was a black and gray tattooer. <laughs> and he, he says, so I've been here 10 years and look at my shop and it's a beautiful operation. Oh my God, it's outrageous. He's got 14 tattooers working for him. And, uh, and so he says, I want you to uh, come and speak to these guys if they'll, you know, and he says, I, I think they're all coming. And so, Sure enough, I spoke to them all about everything from apprenticeship to morals and ethics and what have you. You know, I 
I just covered a lot, multitude of subjects, and uh, and while and 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 addressing the the uh, I guess you'd say the explosion in tattooing. I said, well, it, it seems to me like what we were just talking about that no matter how many there are, there, there doesn't seem to be an overabundance. It just seems like there's always enough to you know, satisfy the need. So uh, I used to complain about everybody that would come in and jump in on the business. I used to piss me off, but, but now it doesn't matter, it seems like, because no matter how many there are doing it, there's that many people that are willing to, you know, uh, sit down in their chairs. So there, the, the supply and demand is uh, is on a pretty good basis now, it seems like, you know? Yeah, I mean, I sat back and watched the slice of the pie gets smaller each and every year but the pie itself is just getting ridiculous. It's uh, so I, I, same thing. I used to be, uh, I, I won't say angry, but it did piss me off that everybody wanted to get into the business. Um, but there's a place for most of them and most of them do okay. As long as they have a decent attitude. Yeah. You know, if, if, if you don't understand how to please people, then you probably should do something else. So let's take this for a minute. Like, what would what kind of advice would you give somebody trying to come into the business these days? <laughs> That's what they asked. A bunch of them said that. What would you advice would you <laughs> give somebody new? And I says, well, like Michael Malone used to tell them, do neon, man. Forget, forget that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh. And, and, and when I when, and when I said you know, do something else. There's way too many already. Well, I used to say that, but anymore, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to matter how many there are. There's takers regardless, you know? So, and everybody seems to be doing business. So what, what are you going to say? You know, there seems to be enough to go around. Yeah. I mean, well, and now these forms of communication, they have a lot to do with it too. That wasn't around back when you started or even through most of your career, you know, you didn't have the ability to take a picture of what you do and show it to people on the other side of the country or around the world on the right. same day at the same time. I mean, so I guess the advertising part got a lot easier and, and word spreads pretty damn fast nowadays. So, well, you know, speaking of the pictures, I remember, uh, I've had guys tell me too. Remember the day when we'd go to conventions and we'd we'd take our old camera and take all these photos and we'd go back, fly back home and put it in the, all this film in the drugstore and wait a week or two to pick it up <laughs> to see what we even did <laughs> or took pictures of. <laughs> and was, now it's just bang, like you said. I was just, uh, I've got another interview, I think next week with a, with a gentleman and we're going to talk about old conventions. And so I spent some time recently going through some of those old photographs and digging through piles and piles of, of pictures and finding some, some good ones from back in the day. Um, just recently. So that, that, you know, at, I was thinking about that just like last week. I, uh, I even came across some pictures of Jack Armstrong doing his very last tattoo and pictures of that tattoo. So like, I, I have all kinds of history and old pictures like that. And right. I got to, I got to go through them and start sharing them because if not, they're going to die in a box somewhere. <laughs> you know? And that's not, that's not good. So uh, I, uh, I, I came across a whole series of photographs that I did of, um, uh, Captain Don Leslie, one of his performances. Oh, I want to say it was at the Houston show in 96. And I took a lot of pictures in series. And I, I got the originals and I'm going to send them off to his son because uh, he wants to display them. Uh, but yeah, I've got all these pictures. I, I'm trying to, I'm going to try and get a lot of them back to the people I, who they're of, you know, because they're not going to do me any good. 
I don't need these pictures, but I took countless pictures for, for decades and I, I just got to get to them. I don't think I have any of you, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll check. You never know. <laughs> uh. But. I'm going to let you get on with your day, sir. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I, I do hope I get to see you again one of these days in person. Maybe get your initials on me. That would be great. And uh, yeah, we're going to do our best to spread the word on this uh, this Heritage Museum project. And Okay, that'll be great. I yeah. sure appreciate that too, because I, I, all it takes is just more grapevine activity, you know, spreading the word, you know. Yeah, it, uh, it's a it's a great cause, and if people are aware of it, I'm sure they'll come through. Well, you know, I don't, I just don't know why we don't have a place that's even thought of as a as a as the place to go, because even Hardy has talked to me about that, you know, and 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 I thought, well, God, you, you surely you got enough to get it going. I mean, if you wanted to, but. In fact, I asked him if he wanted to be on the board, and he says, "Well, I, I says I, I I had to ask you. I, I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but I thought I'd ask you anyway because I didn't want you to be butt hurt because I didn't ask you." And mm -hmm. he and he said, "Well, I would have been butt hurt if you hadn't asked me." <laughs> But, but he, he wanted said, to say no too. <laughs> but he says, I'm, I'm going to have to decline, Charlie. He says, I'm having trouble with my memory. And Doug is running my business, his son, you know. Yeah, I've never met Ed, but I, I've met Doug and I like Doug. He's a good guy. Yeah, he is. And oh. so he said, So I'm going to have to pass, but thanks for uh, off the offer. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>